Good day, Julie. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Thank you for having me. Uh, you and I have not ever met in person, but we've done a video or two in the past. Um, and uh, today it's a little bit more about uh, sharing your journey to where you've gotten now and understanding some of the influences that you've had so that our audience might uh, choose to follow up on that. But we're going to start with uh, an introduction. And if you could please share with us your name and where you grew up. Uh, my name is Julie Dirksen. I was born in Chicago, but I mostly grew up in uh, the Milwaukee area. So, uh, and then I came up to Minneapolis to go to college and I've kind of stayed here since then. So what, uh, where did you go to college and what did you study? Uh, I went to McAllister College, which is a little liberal arts college in St. Paul. And I was a English major with, uh, I think, minors in history and art history. So I hung out in the, you know, over in the liberal arts a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, where do you live now and, and what do you do? I, you know, not very far away from there, actually. I'm just over the river in uh, Minneapolis. I've pretty much um, stayed in the Twin Cities, uh, although I went to graduate school in Indiana for a few years. And then I've Oh, gosh, spent six months in San Francisco, kind of in a small amount of time in D.C., so a few different, a few different places. Um, I'm currently independent, so I, I'm self-employed and I have a consultancy and I do kind of a combination between instructional design, learning strategy consulting. Uh, I also do a lot of speaking and workshops and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the University of Indiana, what, what did you study there? So uh, Indiana University, IU, um, it was instructional systems technology in the School of Education, and uh, it was the really classic uh, instructional design um, curriculum. But mm -hmm. I wound up at Indiana partially because I was really also very interested in, I didn't even call it UX yet. Um, uh, I, think, I think Donald Norman had coined the term by then, but it hadn't kind of made it into common usage. So we were still talking about HCI, so human computer interaction, uh, and then things like user centered design and um, or user -centered, centered systems design and, and all of those kinds of things is kind of things that had grown out of human factors uh, at that point. So, you know, um, and so I wound up in Indiana because they had a, a, I think they had the largest, one of the largest instructional design programs at the time. This was the late 90s, uh, but they also had a good curriculum in. The HCI world, and I was really interested in that as well. Mm -hmm. And the technology uh, word in your program, mm -hmm. I believe that that referred to the application of science and not necessarily digital computer kinds of technologies, or, or am I wrong about that? Uh, it was a mix of both. You know, I mean, it was, it was absolutely the, uh, you know, the really kind of classics of um, instructional systems design, but then also, you know, there was, they had a good solid program in things like technologies for e-learning and distance learning and all of those kinds of pieces as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was really, it was really kind of both, both sides of that coin. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so once you finish that, uh, that degree at Indiana, can you talk, tell us a little bit about your uh, job progression and the kinds of things that you did uh, and for whom and, you know, what they were centered on. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, by the way, I have a small dog under the desk who's decided there's something <laughs> hostile outside. So we may hear, we may hear from her, but um, the, um, uh, so when I graduated uh, from college, it was the early nineties. It wasn't a, it's not a spectacular job market. <laughs> I think, I think a lot of people know about the, how that, uh, how that goes. Um, and so it was really kind of a question of what did I want to do uh, based out of that. I wound up doing um, a certificate course in teaching English as a foreign language, which uh, I think was the first kind of uh, interaction that I had with um, educational psychology and, you know, it was specific towards language learning, but there's a lot that obviously generalizes out to a lot of different things. And at the same time that that was happening, I wound up taking a full-time job. I had a, had a part-time job in college doing data entry for a finance company. You know, it was just a, it was just a make money job. Um, but I think that 
so many people's uh, origin story in instructional design is, hey, you're a good fill in the blank. Do you want to train the other fill in the blank? Um, and then, you know, like, hey, you're a good customer service rep. Do you want to train the other customer service reps? In my case, it was, hey, you're good at this loan data entry. Do you want to train the other people in loan data entry? And I said, sure. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think I, you know, it was not, uh, it was not a spectacular amount of money, but it was a really good, interesting learning experience. And the company that it was with had a lot of growth at the time. Um, they have the slightly oh, dubious distinction now of having been one of the first companies to do the asset-backed securities, so the loan bundling and sales, which, um, you know, eh, didn't work out so well once we get around to, you know, things like 2008 and stuff. But, um, but there was a lot of growth in the company at the time. And so one of the good things about that is that you, without a lot of experience, you could still find yourself kind of taking hold of a, a you know, fair amount of responsibility in the organization. Uh, so we, we were doing the training, but we were also creating it. And I found that the part I really enjoyed was actually the creation of the materials more. I don't mind teaching. I like it a bit. I, but the people who have the energy to do it every day, all day are amazing to me. I, I'm really happy if I get to do a couple hours a week and then I'm good, you know, <laughs> like that's enough extroverting for me. Um, mm-hmm. But I really enjoyed the materials creation part. And we were, you know, this was the early nineties. So like, you know, I think, I think the, some, some total of our tool set was, you know, Microsoft office um, for, you know, materials creation and things like that. Um, and I wound up moving over into their customer service group. And the customer service group had some interesting challenges in that uh, we had like the actual tasks they were doing weren't that hard, but the computer system was so complex and difficult. It was those old AS400 green screen terminals. Um, and the it was just dense, difficult to use, uh, difficult to use computer systems. And so the learning curve. Uh, was mostly just being able to navigate to and operate the, you know, find things in the computer system. Um, you know, I'd say there was probably about a six week learning curve in the basic functions that they needed for customer service. I mean, obviously you can always get better at the service angle, but, but in terms of like, how do you talk to somebody about a loan or, you know, how do you help people with payoff requests or whatever? That wasn't that long. Like, in, like I said, about six weeks. But it took six months for people to get really adept at learning to use the computer system well and being able to move back and forth efficiently. And, you know, they had all the keystrokes memorized and the combinations and they had like nine windows open so that they could jump back and forth. The people who were good at it really figured out a way around the horrible technology because people do. People figure out answers to these things. Um, but, uh, But when they were just about the point that they would start getting good at it was the point where they could transfer to another job in the company. And because there was so much growth, people at the six month mark would be like, hey, I could go to a different area, make more money and people won't yell at me all the time. And so they did that a lot. And so we had this kind of constant churn in the customer service group. And so I actually wound up working on a project. Um, We had somebody who had come over from one of the airlines and she's like, what we really need is a better front end for this computer system so that the data will actually display in a way that these people can use it. And, my talk is very growly this morning. I'm not sure what's going on with her. Um, but, uh, but we needed, so it was a case where, you know, like training, we could train people maybe, uh, you know, we could maybe like train people a little bit faster to get to that level of proficiency. But what we really needed to do was just fix the systems that they were using so that then we could focus on the, the actual functions of the customer service job and not the horrible computer navigation. And get people up to speed faster. Um, And so I wound up working on uh, looking at technologies and trying to figure out what a front end system would look like uh, for, uh, to actually support the job. Um, And I wound up doing things like, one of the problems we had in this computer system is people would call up and they'd wanna do like a refinance. And um, the interest rate would change depending on the amount of their down payment. And so what the poor customer service rep would do is they had one screen for doing loan calculations. They'd fill in all the data. They'd write it down on a piece of paper and then they'd go, okay, if we did 10% down and then if we did 15% down, here's, and they'd wind up with this piece of paper that had four different you know, loan things with the payments and the stuff on it. And I, so I, you know, one of the things I did for them was just to build an Excel widget 
because the formula for calculating loan payments is a set thing. It, you know, it doesn't, it's not that complicated. Um, but uh, so I just built an Excel widget so that they could actually line up four or five different loan offerings in a single spreadsheet and actually just pull them all up at once. Um, and it would lay them out by, you know, I think, I think it would do a reference table to pull the interest rates over. So they didn't even need to look that up and it would just do it by the different down payment amounts and stuff like that. And so all they had to do is fill in the loan amount and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, like that solved a lot of problems um, that training, trying to train people to be better at using the bad system versus just giving them a better tool. Um, it was so clear that giving them a better tool was a better answer to this problem. Yeah. Um, and so I did a bunch of stuff like that and got really interested in um, things like user interface uh, design. And, you know, because I was like, okay, well, we're designing this system. What are the best practices around it? And the answer was, uh, we're not 100% sure with a lot of this stuff. You know, you try to map the workflows and you try to do those kinds of things. I went looking and I found, um, I, I can't find my copy of it. I have other books handy, but, but, but Jacob Nielsen's, let's see if I can get this to focus. Come on. Oh, there it is. There it yeah, is. Jake, Jacob Nielsen's Usability Engineering, which was kind of revelatory to me because you talked about the importance of testing solutions. You know, he was like, here, we could do it this way, we could do it this way. And nobody knows in terms of principles what the answer is. The answer is you test it and here's how you measure it and things like that. And so that kind of, that was the approach that I was coming at all of this stuff with is there's a tr there's part of this that's a training answer, but then there's part of this that's a system answer. And I think it's a little strange as a field that we have decided these are two different disciplines and we shouldn't talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so uh, I know that one of the questions here is where does performance improvement come in? And, and I do think that that was absolutely a place where once I got to graduate school, I'm like, oh, there's, there's a name for this. And, <laughs> you know, we can talk about performance improvements and we can talk to, you know, Gloria yeah. Gary and Great. electronic performance uh, support solutions, which as far as I can tell, nobody reads this anymore. And that makes me sad. True. I mean, the, the whole notion of electronic performance support systems before there was electronics to embed those kinds of things in, you know, it was job aids before that, and it was guidance before that, and mm -hmm. even before that. But uh, yeah, that's uh, something. Well, and luckily, it seems to be coming back. It seems to be coming more popular, performance support or workflow learning or whatever name people are giving it. But uh, um yeah, and, and Indiana University brought a lot of people into my professional society, NSPI, now ISPI, and uh -huh. the notion of performance improvement. And, and when the gurus, the thought leaders back in the mid-60s decided that programmed instruction or instruction itself wasn't making the changes in workplace performance, whatever the workplace was, and they all started looking at what are all the other variables and how do we begin to do that? Because as, as Gary Rumler once told me, that we could build stellar instruction and it still wasn't changing anything. So, you know, they were interested in and in curious about, you know, well, what can they affect? Mm -hmm. It isn't always the answer. And most times it's, you know, a combination of things. But um yeah. When I sometimes draw this continuum and I say, okay, knowledge in the head versus knowledge in the world, which is um, mm -hmm. the title of a chapter in the design of everyday things, which is also a book that I am finding people, I, people are still reading it clearly, but I think less than they, sh they should be. Um, mm -hmm. But he has a chapter called knowledge in the head versus knowledge in the world. And that was a really useful frame for me. And so I sometimes draw this continuum, like, Am I trying to put it entirely into these head or if I move one step over, am I trying to you know, give them a few support resources or maybe like more just in time learning. Right. And then if I move it one step over, we're talking about things like job aids, you know, performance yeah. support systems. If I move it one over now, I'm starting to kind of like build some nudges or some things like microcopy or whatever into the system to try to nudge the performance where it goes all the way to, um, it's completely embedded in the system and it's not, doesn't really require yeah. the human anymore. Um, I, the example I put in my book was um, the uh, uh, soda dispensing machines, right? 
So if you go to these old mom and pop shops, like you would see somebody who knew if they started a soda over here, they'd have time to go take the fries out of the fryer and ring somebody up and come back. And they knew exactly like they just internalized the length of time that it would take yeah. for that soda cup to fill. And they could then thereby, instead of standing there holding the soda cup, they could do two other things at the same time and come back and still not, they wouldn't overflow because they just knew how long it took. And then, you know, McDonald's and whoever else kind of came along and said, well, that seems useful to not make your soda people stand by the soda machine and fill the cup. We'll make the soda machine turn off when the cup is full and you just have the small, medium, large cups on the thing. Yep. And so that's a case where, you know, we we're, we want somebody at a novice level to operate at the level of somebody who's had to learn this through, you know, long, many, many, many repetitions of expertise. I can raise the performance of this 15 year old and it's their first job. Mm -hmm. um, they're probably not as, they're probably not getting as much done while the soda cup fills as the expert is, but nonetheless, yeah. they can go do another thing while the soda cup fills. And if I put that knowledge into the device, I don't have to put that knowledge into their head. And so that's always been one of the big tensions for me across. And for some reason, if it's on the head side of the continuum, it's, it's us, it's instructional design or training or whatever it is. And if it's in the world side of the continuum, it's, you know, like I said, user experience people or interface designers or, you know, engineers or, you know, whatever. And like that, that's always felt a little weird to me how little over, you know, kind of overlap and communication happens in that space. So. Yeah, my experience was uh, uh, getting exposed to total quality management folks and the engineers at Motorola when I was an employee there back in the early 80s. And, and they had a, a fishbone diagram, the Ishikawa diagram that broke it out into four M's. And that was, very, uh, that was so insightful to me. I mean, I knew about Gilbert's behavior engineering model, but the, but the Ishikawa diagram with the non-politically correct, men, machines, methods, and materials, and mm -hmm. do their problem solving in quality circles, looking at those variables, deciding how they could fix things. And that just gave me a, uh, a placeholder for the human performance and where it went and what was sort of the other variables. And the other thing I always learned uh, that I learned from Gary Rumler back in, in 81 was you know, it's usually the process itself. And if it's yeah. the process, it's the consequence system. Mm -hmm. Those things and give, you know, uh, cut the learner some slack and, and you know, the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and as Deming said, you know, 94% of all problems are due to the system, not to individual performers. And so we need to look at those kinds of things. But, but I think your point is that there's a lot of disciplines that can come together and do this. And we've kind of separated them all out and uh, that's unfortunate. And we're left holding the bag for something that might not actually address yeah. the issue. And then we catch the blame for that. Yeah. Well, I have a personal resolution never to do any software training ever again. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and it doesn't make sense for me to do software training. Like I'm too expensive a resource for, for mm -hmm. software training. Um, but I did a lot of it, you know, over the years I worked for, uh, after graduate school, I worked for Allen Interactions. And so did many, many e-learning projects as a, I did project management and instructional design there and, um, and did many, many, many software design, uh, software training projects. And Every single one of them, it's like, if you just fix this system, we could cut this training by 80%, you know, mm -hmm. like the reason, like there was one, it was a pharma system. And there was a point where like, at some point we had to tell the user that in order to add a new record, they just had to click a blank gray box at the bottom of the screen. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You can't, you can't put the words new case on the gray box. Like, are you seriously, seriously? You know, like how, how is this a problem that training is supposed to magically solve that they know that the gray box is going to add the new, you know, add the mm -hmm. new case button. And I'm just like, yeah, I, oh, uh, so. I guess we, that just gives us a lot of opportunity to help <laughs> right. point things out. So did that, did, the, did these uh, jobs that you're just describing, did that take us to San Francisco? Is that part of the. Um, so the, let's see the, the flow of things I worked for the finance company until I went to graduate school. 
um, in, in, like I said, in some different roles. And I got to do, I was doing project management on the computer system. And then when I was in graduate school, one of the nice things that happened is um, Marty Siegel had the uh, Center for uh, Excellence and Innovation, Innovation and Excellence something like that. Um, gosh, it's, it's, it's more than 20 years ago now, so I guess it can be fuzzy on the details. But um, And he was trying to do a tech transfer startup with something called Wisdom Tools. And uh, so I wound up doing a large project through them as it was my graduate assistant work, which one of the nice things that I don't think anybody knows about graduate school for instructional design is that it's, it's, it's an easier field to get funding than, than a lot of others because you can do, you can work in so many places in the university supporting, you know, online education in other areas of the university. And so there's, there's a, there's way more access to, cause uh, you know, in, in the end, my, I, I think I paid, I think I had to pay like $500 in fees every semester or something, but I mean, I basically got a master's degree for two grand in fees. Mm-hmm. And even that I, you know, and then I got a stipend on top of it to kind of support life while I was in graduate school. So, um, so it's a really lovely, you know, that's a, that's a lovely bonus that I don't think I knew about before I went. Um, uh, but I wound up doing a large project for Eli Lilly that we rolled out in, I want to say seven countries and did, did a couple of translation things. And it was all built in Lotus Notes. Um, if anybody remembers Lotus Notes, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. But, uh, um, but nonetheless, like dealt with a lot of kind of techno- technological issues. And then after mm-hmm. that, I was at uh, I was at Allen and Actions from like 2000 to 2008. Um, learned a huge amount there. Uh, learned a ton of stuff from Michael Allen and all the people there. Did a lot, a lot of e-learning projects. Saw a lot of different companies and a lot of different industries. Uh, and then after that, I was briefly for about a year and a half. I was at a company that did project management, um, PMP certification training, and then uh, and then I left there in 2010 with the intention of writing the book at that point, uh, which I did and which came, the book came out in 2011. And then San Francisco was an ed tech startup actually that was looking to do kind of a, in the same way that a lot of the community colleges were uh, acting as a bridge, you know, more affordable bridge in terms of getting your, you know, your general requirement credits and some of those kinds of things out of the way they were looking. Um, It's a group called Altius Education and it went the way of so many startups, Um, uh, but they were looking to kind of bridge that gap between um, uh, an affordable, you know, similar to, they 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 didn't have quite the same model as a Phoenix, but, you know, it was a similar kind of like, hey, Mm -hmm. you know, we can be a cost-effective way for you to get some of these general distribution requirements. And then they had partnerships with a lot of four-year universities where the students could then transition into a land-based university after the, after the fact. But they were trying to do some new interesting things in terms of the LMS stuff, technology. Uh, and they also had some nice things around supporting students. Like they had a, what they referred to as a success coach for students because they were dealing with a lot of students who were, you know, they might be parents or they might have other jobs or they might, you know, be first generation students and things like that. And so they were very committed to trying to figure out how do we, how do we support these people with all, you know, all of these variables, not just expect them to, you know, like not, not concern ourselves with their lives other than to have them, you know, submit their assignments and stuff like that. Um, But, you know, like I said, startups, especially in, this would have been, the 2010s early on, I can't remember exactly year offhand, but there were a lot of, there are a lot of startups. There's been a lot of ed tech startups. Lots of them haven't quite managed to make it all the way through. So, you know, this one kind of, this one kind of did that as well. So, um, but a lot of smart people trying to work on, you know, significant problems. So. Mm -hmm. So then you went from San Francisco back to uh, the yeah, the San Francisco was always a six month kind of temporary thing. So I didn't ah. like move, move per se. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and then I had been working prior to that. I'd been working in DC for a while on, oh gosh, I'm going to say that was like 2008. And it was a health, you know, it was a health coaching application, but it was pre-smartphone. And so I think they were just a couple of years too early on that one you know, like all of the health coaching stuff that we now have, you know, whether it's mm-hmm. Noom or um, Fitbits or, you know, all of those kinds of things. They were trying to do that, but they were trying to do it 
pre, you know, like I think they needed, I think they needed to be just a few years later when the smartphone stuff would start to become available and that you could have that kind of thing in your pocket all the time. So, mm-hmm. well, so you mentioned your book, that you have that handy and you can hold that up. I for- do, yeah. And this is the second edition. It is the yellow cover is the second edition and the first edition and the second edition um, about 70 or 80 percent of the book is pretty similar um here's my you know, i'm trying mm-hmm. to get the the right zoom focus but um <laughs> yeah. uh the um uh but the the second edition has a couple of additional chapters because as i found oh a lot so much was happening in social learning that we needed i needed to add a chapter that really kind of dug into the different methods of that and there's people who are smarter on that topic than i am but um but i you know felt like it should be covered in the book and I added a chapter. I I talked about habits in the first edition, but I really broke out a whole chapter on habit uh, because I do think that that's an interesting area and the science is progressing in that um, around the whole question of kind of helping people with habit formation. Um, I think we're becoming increasingly aware. I mean, you know, we talk about management training and there's all this management leadership training and I think probably, you know, the vast majority of good management is habit driven. Um, You know, are you giving feedback on a regular basis? Are you following up with people? Are you checking in? Are you being clear about your instructions? All of these kinds of, you know, are you delegating well? Like all of these things are very habit focused. And I think if you really recognize that you're trying to help somebody develop a habit and not just, because you can't tell people habit. I can't say, guy, you really should floss every day and expect that that's going to somehow magically make that happen. It's a totally, hopefully you do floss every day, but you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. it's not, you know, we can, we can talk habit um, and can tell people, but it's that the, the things that, that help people with habit development, like Goldwitzer's implementation intentions, or um, again, performance support is a big thing, I think, in terms of helping people kind of, um, Dave Ferguson has a model where he talks about job aids either being guardrails or uh, training wheels. Mm-hmm. And, you know, training wheels is very much frequently about habit formation. Like you're going to need this for a while, but then eventually you're going to just do it without thinking about it. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's going to become automatic. Um, and so, uh, so I added a chapter about habits and then also purely for page count reasons. I, uh, and, uh, you know, because it seems to come last in the process. I hadn't really had a dedicated chapter on evaluation. So that's, that was another add in for the second edition. Well, it's a, it's a great book and uh, very, very wildly popular, I think I might say, but uh, I have the Kindle version of it and I'm glad you had it to hold up because I can't hold up my Kindle and show everybody. Um, So we talked a little bit about your exposure to what I call human performance technology or what ISPI calls human performance technology, also known as human performance improvement, or basically evidence-based practices for performance or instruction or learning. Um, And so we touched on that a little bit, but but if you were to point uh, new people to some of the earliest resources, references, You've covered a couple of these already, but but those that were impactful to you early on in, in your journey, uh, what would, what might you add? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, I I pulled. I have a very uh, original. Co- I don't know if it's quite an original. It yep. certainly looks like it. It's an ex library copy. There's Robert Mager. Um, you know, I think he was very influential, partially because he's just such a commonsensical guy in the way that he writes about these things and, Mm -hmm. you know, really breaks it down so clearly. He was also influential to me in terms of like, oh, that's how you, that's how you write about these topics. You, you figure out ways to make it really easy and concrete along with the Donald Norman book. They were both people who I looked at um, and said, okay, not only is this really useful kind of good, information to think about and ways to orient myself in the world and things like that, but also like, look at how they're, look at how they're explaining things. And Mm -hmm. so when I, when I did do my book, that was one of the things was to try to come up with something that, that fit into that genre, I guess, of um, accessible to, uh, 
uh, accessible to anybody. There's there's a few other books in other fields. Uh, I don't think I pulled Don't Make Me Think, which is the one for UX, but the non-designer's design book was another mm-hmm. one where I looked at it. And it's kind of a meta thing, right? Because um, I was looking at those partially as a, okay, what kind of book do I want to write? But then also this is like, this is bottom line, what we're trying to do for our learners a lot of the time is how do I take this and make it something that will facilitate performance, you know, um, uh, something that will, that this person can then go and actually do the thing. Um, because what I was seeing, because so many people have their origin story based in domain knowledge, you know, you're a good X, you're going to, you're going to train X. They're coming at it with this level of expertise, this level of domain knowledge, which is great. They absolutely need that to teach, you know, other people or somebody, somebody needs to have the domain knowledge. It's real important. Um, But they often didn't have a good background in how do you translate that, you know, into good learning experiences for other people. And so that's, that's what I feel like, has been one of the big focuses uh, of both writing the book and kind of my career afterwards is how are you, again, it gets kind of meta because I'm trying to think of how do I use the methods that I understand from performance improvement and performance support and use it for instructional designers to be better at doing that for other people. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. it kind of layers on top of each other. Um, But yeah, you know, they're, they're looking at all of looking at all of these different people. Uh, the other person who I think is outside of uh, the classic realm for what I think you know what you're usually talking about, but I think was enormously influential on me um, was I'll, I'll hold this one up, Kathy Sierra, um, and she did a blog in the mid 2000s. Who so I think she shut it down in like 2005. I want to say. Um, but this is the book she did a little bit after it's about us making users awesome. But she also was um, every time I think I have a really good idea that's sort of novel, I find out that Kathy wrote about it like 15 years ago and explained it better than I do. And so, um, uh, so she was somebody who I think just from a pure design point of view, like how do we create experiences that are meaningful and resonant for people and that, you know, help, build build in um, the right kind of motivation piece for it and all of those kinds of things. She was somebody else who was, and I don't think she fits in the standard hierarchy of, uh, of these people, but nonetheless, I, you know, again, I don't think anybody reads her stuff much these days. And that makes me sad because it's all amazing. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of good work, uh, readings, uh, writings, uh, uh, all sorts of gurus and thought leaders that we can learn from that aren't necessarily part of the learning and development uh, world um, Mm -hmm. have influence on what we do. Uh, But let me shift gears here. Mm -hmm. And as a way of uh, providing an example to our audience, if you were to give a 30 second elevator speech on what it is you do, for example, if you're at a neighborhood party and somebody comes up and says, Julie, what do you do? What do you say to them? I do. I do say, oh, I'm an instructional designer. And then I wait for the, the blank look and the head tilt. And then I say, I, I work um, with like training and development to help people develop curriculum for things. And my background is in things like educational psychology, but it's all in workplace environments. And that usually people are like, oh, okay. You know, like that's usually enough. Um, Judy Katz always says, I, I make things that help people learn, which I think is a nice, has a nice kind of succinctness. Mm-hmm to it that I appreciate, but I, I not sure people know what, the, like, I always, i always feel the need to slightly over explain. Everybody's got that though, right? Like everybody's got their little elevator pitch for what, it, what is it that you do? Um, so, because it's not a, it's not, it has no name brand recognition. Let's just put it that way. Exactly. And, and we've all learned that most of the time, whatever we say doesn't resonate with the listener. They're, they're just clueless. I've had yeah. Those ask me, you know, after after asking me this question this over and over again, you know, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you do. But what I think they can't figure out is that how can you develop training or deliver training on a job you've never had? That just right. doesn't work for them. They just can't figure that out. Uh, but anyway, yeah. it's one of life's mysteries that. Uh, yeah. 
Well, and, and in about do. one in maybe 40 or something where they'll be like, oh, okay. And you're yeah. like, you're just shocked because you're like, oh, oh, wait, I don't have to explain this to you. That's so exciting. You're pulling my leg, right? Yeah. yeah. You actually know what that means? Oh, wow. <laughs> so. All right. Let me shift gears again here. As a lifelong learner, uh, can you share with us anything that you're currently focused on in learning? And are you doing any writing that's accessible to uh, our audience? Yeah, well, the next, apparently, like, my book iteration cycle is about one every 10 years or so, um, and some do, again, uh, it'll probably be slightly more than 10 to get it out, but um, but the next book, as soon as I can manage to get the proposal stuff finished to my publisher, um, is going to be a book on behavior change, um, because there's so much interesting stuff coming up in the behavioral sciences. Uh, I think Nudge just had their, Nudge as a book just had their 10 year anniversary, something like that. Um, I it was probably last year, so it's probably 11 or 12 years now, but um, that was a book by um, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein that I think really introduced behavioral economics to the world. Uh, and then subsequently things like Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. And, um, and so there's the behavioral economics piece, but then there's also so much coming up through the behavioral, you know, behavioral sciences in terms of research. It's where a lot of that habit formation stuff lives too. Um, uh, and it's very cross-disciplinary. Um, you know, there's, there's versions of it that, that live, but now I think they're starting to kind of identify and talk to each other more. Um, and so the intention is to do one on specifically the behavior change question in learning design. And I, my short version of what I, what I'm specifically targeting there is they know what to do, but they're still not doing it. Um, and, you know, uh, the problem isn't that we haven't explained it, the problem isn't we haven't taught it. To go back to the flossing example, you know, people can know they should floss their teeth. People can know how to floss their teeth. People can even really actually genuinely want to floss their teeth. And then they're still not flossing their teeth on a regular basis. And so what are we, what are we doing, you know, in that space? And what does that require? What I, cause I, I did a project, oh gosh, I think it's like 17 years ago now. Um, it was when I was still at Allen and it was a project through the university of Minnesota's, um, like the epidemiology school, but it was AIDS and HIV prevention. Um, and it was a technology-based intervention for that. And the problem at the time wasn't that we hadn't communicated the importance of condom usage for STD prevention, you know, um, like they, people knew. And so there were whole, you know, what telling them louder and more emphatically is probably not going to change the behavior. And so what was going on there? Like what were all of the variables involved? And that gets into a whole slew of complicated things, right? Um, it is not a small, um, it is not a small number of variables that are kind of coming into play around, around those kinds of things. And so I got very, very interested in that and really involved. And I feel like it's problematic that we haven't brought more of that science over into L&D. Um, you know, there's really good work being done in that area. Um, and I think really good models that are being developed, uh, Combi from Susan Mickey is kind of a favorite, uh, or sometimes referred to as the behavior change wheel. Um, there's BJ Fogg, which I, I find slightly less useful, but, um, but I think is still, you know, solid, a solid contribution. Um, you know, there's some other areas where that stuff's coming in and it's not, it's not making its way over to L&D nearly as much as it should be, right? Um, and, you know, the, as you mentioned, sort of alluded to before, there's all these different people that are involved in this. And so some of the things that they're talking about in these environments are absolutely the things that, you know, the performance support people were talking about in the 80s, you know, enabling the behaviors, making it easier, creating systems that support it, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but trying to be um, a little bit more holistic and also pull in the academic research that's happening in those areas that start to tell us a little bit about what's what's more or less effective um, in those spaces. Because basically in things like healthcare, the really big problems that are hard to solve are the human behavior ones. You know, I mean, yeah, there's technology that we're still working on, but like they're making strides in that area. So the really big persistent problems are, you know, related to human behavior, as we all know, given that we've just gone through the biggest 
um, behavior change experiment in the history of the world in the last few years with COVID and things like that. So yeah, complicated. People are complicated, but I like big chewy problems. So that that's a happy thing. So you think that book will be coming out in a year or two? Yeah, I, you know, I really just need to pull the trigger on um, uh, getting the getting the contract stuff sorted out, and and then the estimate is probably eight to ten months for you know writing it, and then once they once they have it in hand, they actually do turn turn the publication time pretty quickly. Um, my publisher, um, uh, although supply chain stuff around printing materials and things like that has made that a little bit more complicated, uh, but hopefully, so. Fingers crossed, hopefully, you know, hopefully pretty quickly. So well, I look forward to uh, when this comes out. Um, and you and I have talked in a previous video that we did for LDA about uh, this topic. And I, I think I'll share that uh, online again and, and refresh at least yeah. if you, uh, from you in, ter- in that regard. And it's a, a preface to the book, perhaps. So let me uh, switch gears here again. Um, this one is about uh, language, our terminology, et cetera. And my question is, is there a performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us as perhaps you feel it's being uh, misused or misconstrued and you'd like to put your particular spin on it? What would you have for us? Yeah, it's not one of, you know, it's not one of the old school ones. It's the newfangled space, but I feel pretty strongly about it. So I'm going to, I'm going to take on LXD, going to take on learning experience design. Um, here's, here's the thing with that one. Uh, I have seen a lot of kind of hand wavy definitions of what LXD is. It's about centering the user. It's about really considering what the kind of experience it is. It's, you know, um, it's using design thinking to, you know, whatever. And I, I, they all make me a little crazy um, because it, nothing, almost nothing in most of these definitions tell me what they're doing that a good instructional designer isn't, isn't already doing. Um, uh, and so I thought a lot about that one because obviously LXD, whatever, you know, like nobody owns the definition, nobody gets to define it, but I'm going to take my, I'm going to take a swing at my version of it, um, uh, is uh, arguably a, something that evolved out of user experience design and user experience design, the, the origins of that term are Don Norman in the mid nineties, um, who is the, you know, one of the grandfathers of usability, user experience design, all of those kinds of things. So he has pretty good cred to name things if he wants to. Um, uh, and, and so if we follow through that thread and we say, okay, coming in from user experience design, I, I know a lot of UX people for whatever reason, I have a big swath of my personal, like personal friend circle are UX designers. Um, uh, and uh, also information architects, which we, we should have more of too. But um, the, um, the bottom line is, is that the way that I see it is the three biggest competencies in UX. There's lots of other things that are important. I don't want to make be reductive about it, but I, the three really non-negotiable competencies are um, user research, uh, prototyping, and user testing. And so in user research, it, yeah, it actually involves things like talking to actual users. Um, ideally you do what's referred to as contextual inquiry where you actually go like follow people around in, our, in most of our cases in their workplace. Um, uh, there's a lot of other user research methods that UX has continued to evolve, which I think is actually really important given that I feel like it's been a little bit more stagnant in our field because not enough people are doing it. And so there hasn't been that same evolution. Um, uh, the prototyping piece, you know, that's fine, whatever, but the user testing, which is, I, I will, whenever I'm talking about anything related to this, I'll, I'll ask the room, how many people are watching users use the materials that they create? And I've never gotten above half. I frequently have far less than that. And these are self-selecting audience of people who are interested in the topic. So it's probably much worse in the broader field. But one of the things that I did in graduate school is I went to the little, the little usability lab 
where we had video cameras set up so that we could see the computer screen and also record the face of the user to see what their reactions were. And we ran them through a system and actually watched what happened. And could they use it and could they do the thing, right? And I think we have an extra level of evaluation that's, that goes on top and it's a learning experience because somebody can navigate it, but that doesn't mean it's actually effective or gonna do the next thing. Um, but anyway, the, the upshot of all of this is if you want to call yourself an LXD and you are actually spending time with your users, preferably in their workplace environment, you are prototyping solutions and you are testing them by watching users use them to figure out if it's accomplishing the thing that you want to accomplish, then you can call yourself whatever you want and I don't care. If you are not doing those three things, then I do not want to hear about you being user-centered or learner-centered or learner-centered design because I kind of don't believe it. So that's my, mm -hmm. that's my hot take. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's that hot a take, but you know what I mean? Like that's my, that's my bottom line on this one. Yeah, but I think as you said, these are things that, that good instructional designers or instructional systems designers should have been doing all along. Absolutely. You mentioned yeah, Bob absolutely. Mager and Bob Mager and I, uh, he allowed me to put out a, a video of his uh, banquet speech at ISPI from 1999. And uh, it was called the perfect banquet speech because it is Bob Mager and he was a perfectionist. He made me edit the video seven times before he allowed me to release it. But in that video, he talks about testing and the failure in our field to test what it is we do. And then he gave a bunch of examples from outside of uh, instructional design that had to do with, uh, you know, why did Chevy call that car Nova uh, when South, when, you know, Spanish populations were you know, a big part of the market and the car meant no go. And yeah. he gave a bunch of examples that, that, we, that we don't do enough testing and of course, his big thing was, you know, setting up uh, instructional objectives, uh, performance-based instructional objectives. If you if you really look at what a lot of what he was talking about, depending on the context, educational or or enterprise uh, corporate learning. But um, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think you know th this has been a huge issue for a long time, and and the thought leaders uh, in the professional groups that I hung around with always complained about this. They were complaining about when I got in the field in 1979, that our language was sloppy, that you, you know, you'd always have to really probe and question, test your understanding of what do people mean by the, the language that they use, because we just didn't have any, you know, authority to say, this is what it means, no kidding, and don't vary from that. We, so, so this is an interesting challenge, and I think it might have to be a different, a different conversation. But um, if people in the field aren't testing their solutions, how would we take a performance support approach to fixing that? Well, yeah, I mean, I, that, I, I agree. If you because you're just if you're just a, with a hope and a prayer, I guess. Because if if you don't do the upfront analysis, which would include understanding the user's performance context and the situational variables in that context and what is they're trying to do? And is, is that rote or is that very? What are they trying to produce? And is that rote or is that very? We don't understand any of that. We can't build instruction, which to me is performance support and or learning experiences. But but if we can't provide them with what they need, and you know, it, it, and if we try to force people to memorize way too much, which is the whole thing with guidance and job aids and all of that, is that. If we, if we try to force people to memorize them, they can memorize it in the instruction, in the training, and then go back out to the job and forget it all, what have we accomplished? And yeah. so that testing, you know, at, at the end point of the learning and then later on back out on the job, did it really transfer? Does it have an impact? You know, we we don't do that, but, but I'm going to channel... Uh, Deming at this point, you know, it's really the system that, that the yeah. practitioners are uh, trapped in. Their yeah. L&D leadership hasn't put in place the processes and the practices and then trained and developed their people in those that have proven to be successful ultimately back out on the job for the learners. And right. um, I, I think too often when we 
complain about things that practitioners, you know, we're not, we're not, we need to excuse them. I mean, they have a role in this, but, but they can't fight the system. We can't expect them to mm-hmm. battle with, with their entire leadership system and all of their processes, you know, but it is a challenge. Yeah. And it's hard to learn and develop and grow yourself to be a more uh, proficient practitioner. If, if you're saddled with all these barriers to your own performance. Um, yeah. Well, and that's, you know, like the, the demi it's the alleged likely demi quote about every system is perfectly designed to produce the result it produces. I'm kind of obsessed with that one, right? Like if Mm -hmm. this is what's happening in the industry, what about the system is creating this? Now, unfortunately, I don't think anybody's going to pay us the time that, you know, pay for us to figure this one out. But I do think it is the challenge, right? You know, um, nobody's doing level three evaluation from, you know, uh, it's it's not because they haven't been to the session where we say, you know, level three evaluation Mm -hmm. is super important. So what's causing this to happen? You know, what's, what is endemic in this system that is creating the result that we're seeing? Uh, because wow. yeah, telling people louder and more emphatically is, is in fact exactly what I'm saying is not, not the, not the fundamental answer to that one. So, yeah. you know, this is the stuff, uh, try to figure these things out. I mean, you know, <laughs> like I said, a lot of like for my book and hopefully for the next book is to give people enough tools to get them in the neighborhood. That's usually the, what I, you know, so yeah. how I describe it, right? Like I am not going to make you a perfect instructional designer by reading my book, but can I move you away from several practices that are problematic and at least get you in the neighborhood of, of some things mm-hmm. that are better choices? Um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's a lot of my world right now. So. Mm-hmm. No, I, I agree that. And if we can help people influence their own leadership, if we can help them get their leadership to the point where they see that, you know, what they're doing is not totally effective and that there's a better way to do it um, and make incremental steps to getting there without upsetting the whole apple cart, um, you know, we can maybe serve those people better and, and make their lives eventually easier. It's like the gray box. You mean we can't put the word in the gray box. You mean we can't, you know, change our process and, and measure transfer because otherwise, you know, yep. for the chopping block, when the, uh, when the finances don't work out and aren't projected to be so well, then we're, you know, we're not, not going to be seen as the valuable assets that we could be seen as within mm-hmm. our uh, world. Well, uh, this thing is hard, you know, like I advocate for spending time with users and testing solutions on every single project I'm ever involved on. And there have been plenty where I haven't been able to make it happen. So I, yeah. I appreciate that, like, it's easy to say, and it's not always right. easy right. to do. Yeah. And sometimes we've got to decide, is that the hill to die on? Or should we, you know, try to build a trusting relationship with the client and then earn the respect and perhaps the opportunity to help them make a change and to nudge them along without it becoming nagging. That's my little thing here is a nudge and nag. You know, if it interrupts yeah. the workflow, if it interrupts somebody's world, if it, you know, is inconvenient at the time, it's less of a nudge and maybe more of a nag, but that's just uh, something I've been uh, thinking about lately. Um, so let me shift gears again here now. So we talked a little bit about some of your the earlier influences, and you may have mentioned some of the people that are, are and, and books and articles and such that are more recent, but so for our audience here, who are people that are uh, newer on the scene, if you will, or their materials uh, and thinking is, is newer on the scene and that you might share with people and say, you know, besides getting well-grounded in some of those things that were perhaps influential to you early in your career, what who are what are some of the new things that that people might look toward? Uh, internal to the field, I mean, I feel like people like Will Talheimer and Patty Shank are both doing really great work in terms of bringing over evidence based practice into um, into the field, and and again, doing that distillation of trying to make it into um, you know usable usable material. Um, Miriam Nealon's blog with Paul Kirshner is is really handy too. Uh, She's still blogging. They're both still blogging, which is great because blogging seems to have, you know, largely evaporated. But um, and so those are some people that I think are really important. Um, 
Uh, I do think one of the things that we we have to have to have to get better at is the accessibility stuff. And so following Susie Miller is great. She did the book in the UK on accessibility stuff, but also if you follow her on LinkedIn or whatever, she's just putting out really great material in, in that space. And that needs to be table stakes. Like the fact yeah. that we're as behind in that field as we are is, well, it's quite frankly shameful. I mean, you know, it's, um, uh, and, and it won't change unless, you know, everybody holds kind of, you know, the, the tool creators and everybody's kind of feet to the fire on it. And things are hard. I mean, it's, you know, it's difficult to like re-engineer stuff in a hurry. And I totally appreciate that. But at the same time, this is, this is not, this is not what modern technology needs to look like um, in terms of, you know, in terms of those kinds of things. Um, outside of the uh, field, like I said, the behavioral science stuff is really important to me right now. It's Susan Nikki stuff out of University College London Center for Behavior Change. Uh, also, um, just for who, who to kind of follow that shares out really good stuff. Um, Samuel Saltzer, who's out of Europe, has a great feed. Uh, I think he had like the Habit Daily or the Habit Weekly or something like that, but his you know, his newsletter is quite good. And then also behavioralscientist.org, I'm pretty sure is the, the URL. And they're putting stuff out that's that's very good as well. And I think there's a lot of things in there. Like I said, just need to make it back over into L&D so that we don't waste time doing stuff that isn't accomplishing very much in a lot of these. Uh, you know, we trained a whole bunch of people. We spent a whole bunch of money and we took them off the floor for a really long time. And then because they can, they're they're just ignoring it because we didn't factor in the 17 other things that are going to influence whether that behavior happens or not. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, a number, a number of different people happy to provide URLs for all of that stuff. But yeah, if you would send that to me, I will include that in the uh, YouTube show notes and in the blog post that I'm going to do to introduce this video. Uh, yeah. I need to remember everybody I said. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll let you look at the uh, at the video, and then we can uh, backtrack and, and back. Mm -hmm. uh, Julie, so let me wrap up by asking you one final question, and that is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience? And I'm assuming that uh, people new to the field um, um, or old hands, if you will, but what would you recommend uh, that they focus on um, as they begin their journey? So I think the biggest problem as a field that we have, and I probably brought this up in previous conversations, but I do think one of the, the biggest issues that we do have is a lack of a feedback loop. We frequently do not get very good data about how effective our solutions are or not. Um, and so I think one of the most important things that anybody can do as a professional in this field is try to figure out how to improve that feedback loop. And the issue with it is sometimes it feels overwhelming. I mean, it's not the only issue, but it's one of the big ones. If you're in an organization that collects um, metrics and data, um, then it's not that hard. It's not as hard, right? Um, but if you're not in an organization that has any kind of metrics or data that you can leverage, then it gets much, much more difficult, right? Um, one of the things I've been trying to encourage people to think about is, okay, maybe you can't get results for your entire population, but can you do follow up with 20 people, right? Where you're actually getting some meaningful data. I mean, it's not it wouldn't stand up to an academic review for a publishable paper, but it's going to help you. It's going to give you information that you wouldn't have had otherwise about what's working and what's not working. Um, I sometimes ask the question uh, when I'm talking about user testing, has anybody who's ever taught a class, have you ever not changed anything about your delivery between the first time you taught the class and the second time you taught the class? And everybody's like, no, of course you change stuff. You know, like, oh, that the instructions for that activity weren't very good or this ran too long or that or whatever. And whenever we're creating e-learning, we're almost always missing that feedback loop. It gets built. I send it out to a few people to review. Is the standard answer? My SMEs look at it. Um, but we don't ever, you know, we don't ever see, and like, it doesn't take very much. Get a couple of users, create a Zoom call, have them share their screen, watch them go through it. Like it does not take that long to do it and it can make an enormous difference because it's exactly the kind of thing that you were finding out when you're teaching in-person classes and we're missing that feedback in digital resources. So the big question is, how am I finding out 
with whether or not what I'm doing is working or not working and so that I can get better at doing this. You know, I think that's the, the fundamental thing. And are there little hacks I can do if I can't get data on a whole population, which I totally understand why data on a whole population is hard, but I think just kind of keep telling people they need to collect that is clearly not getting the result that we want. So what else can we do? Mm -hmm. Good advice. Julie, thank you so much for doing this uh, video interview with me today. And uh, thank you for all of your contributions to the field. Yeah, this is really fun. I'm always happy to, to talk shop guys. So, you know, it's my favorite thing. So <laughs> thanks again. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.